Good afternoon. Good. Good, afternoon. Good afternoon. My name is Ronald, and I'm from Forbid Exchange. Forbid Exchange is a top 20, top 22 exchange on coin market cap. We've got 600 clients, and I'm going to share with you what I've learned working together with the 600 projects that choose to partner up with Forbid Exchange. All right. I'm here to drop three facts. It's going to be a very short speech. The first fact is today, Bitcoin has reached $57,000. Come on, guys. <laughs> Let's try it. Bitcoin has reached $57,000. All right. That's, that's the only fun part of my speech. The rest is all quite serious. How do I change the slides? Forbid Exchange is a centralized exchange. We heard this discussion just now. All right. And the biggest problems that the projects come to us to solve is how do we propagate the ideas of these projects to the global community? All right. And it's really um, two broad bases when people purchase tokens or purchase coins. The first one is speculative. And when it comes to speculation, it's pretty simple. As long as the number goes up, or as long as the chart goes to the top right, you understand it, I understand it, all of us understand it. So speculators are not the people that we are chasing in Probit Global, or rather for all our partners as well. What we focus on is on the utility of the project tokens that come onto our exchange. Right. So, when it comes to the utility, why, how do we understand the point of the token? How do we propagate the ideas? And this is the first fact, the first tip, is that it's language, language, language. When it comes down to purchasing tokens, holding tokens, purchasing coins, holding coins. It represents a financial value. And when there is financial value involved, you don't want to use a system where the language is foreign to you. This is number one. Right? And it's so basic. It's so basic. In my company, we go for the long-tail markets. We aim to make crypto accessible for all. And that means 40, 42 languages, right? And out of which, whenever a project comes to us, whenever a project works together with us, we give them 10 or 20 different languages announcements. Because we believe that crypto should be accessible, and the first step of accessibility is for people to understand the ideas that you are propagating. Right? Language, language, language. And you and I, we are really, really lucky. We speak English. Right? We speak English. And we are really lucky because most of the information in the crypto world is in English. But for one person that can speak English, there are so many people who do not speak English perfectly well. They don't dare to, to put a um, substantial amount of their fortune into something that they don't exactly understand. And that's why language, language, language is so important. Right? This is the first one. The second point is ease of use. Right? When it comes down to ease of use, I think it was also mentioned in the previous panel, the centralized exchanges were saying, well, it's easier to use. It's easier to use, but I will bring up the points that they didn't mention. Right? First of all, we are living in a world where liquidity is being separated and being split up in a lot of different chains. A lot of different chains. Right? And when your liquidity is spread out on all these different chains, Ethereum killers, L1, uh, other L2s, it presents a problem. It's not so easy to get your token from one place to another, even though it's the same token. And this is my expectation. My expectation is that 
I believe in the future, people will not be trading tokens to token so much, but of the same token from one chain to another chain. This is what I think. Right? And so how do you do it? It is very intuitive when you use when you use a wallet withdrawal page. So this is a very typical wallet withdrawal page. And here already you have a cross-chain functionality. You deposit USDT ERC20 version and you withdraw TRC20 version, you have done a cross-chain transaction. Right? And there are many really good decentralized bridges out there for sure. There are many really good ones. But yet, when it comes down to the long-tail markets, right, when it comes down to the markets that we are trying to reach into, these people are so used to having this kind of interface. Right? Another issue with decentralized bridges is that it's not very accessible. My whole philosophy working in crypto for so many years is that I believe that crypto should be accessible not just for you and me, but for everyone, right? And what does that mean? That means that if they have to go on Ethereum L1, pay $20 for approval, token approval, pay $60 or $69 for uh, cross-chain bridging, that's not very accessible. And what do we tell people who find this expensive? Do we tell them, oh yes, thank you, come again, um, come back when you can afford it? No. We don't say such stuff, right? When I first started my crypto journey, my first system that I used was also a centralized exchange. And from there, I started to go through the tenets, the founding principles, the founding ethos of cryptocurrency, right? learn the importance of decentralization, learn the importance of privacy, so on and so forth. However, Everyone needs to take the first step in this journey. And the most accessible way to do it is through a centralized exchange. I've got my intern to list out the pros and cons. Let's run through them. Convenient, most of us have a wallet. Uh, most of us have accounts in centralized exchanges. It is one of the tools in the toolbox. I don't really enjoy the conversations when people ask me, oh, you're going to die, the DEXs are coming. Yes, the DEXs are there, I use DEXs too. But I am pretty sure we can coexist because of these reasons. It's convenient, it's a familiar interface to you and I and a lot of other people. Right? It's a one-stop shop, you can trade, you can IEO, you can withdraw, so on and so forth. And most importantly, you can verify the track record of the bridge. In this case, a crypto exchange. Search the crypto exchange at the word hack at the end and see if there are any results. There are some crypto exchanges that have been around for a very long time in terms of crypto time. And these crypto exchanges, they have a verifiable track record. They have a verifiable track record. You can see, you know, when you put your coins into the exchange, you know that you're going to take it out, right? So these are the pros of using centralized exchanges as a cross-chain bridge. We are not thinking of centralized exchanges so often as cross-chain bridges, but maybe from today we can start. The cons, of course, we are not decentralized. We are not. And I understand the founding principles of cryptocurrency. Right? But as I mentioned before, not everyone, when they first start out their crypto journey, thinks about that. We need to guide them through. We need to guide them through, and once they start learning about the utility or about the ideals of these projects or these big coins, then they can start thinking of decentralization. Because decentralization is not cheap. Right? You need to get consensus, and consensus somehow has to be paid for. Decentralization is not cheap. And the second con, I'm not even sure if that's a con or not, but our safety features are hidden. Right? So, 
most decentralized bridges, they are auditable, they are transparent, and I love the fact that they are. Right? However, they, that also means that, well, we are open to attacks. What is a bridge? A bridge is a place where you take a coin and you mint a representation of this coin that you have locked. So it is a honeypot. And if there is anything that we know about honeypots in crypto exchange is that we are a huge honeypot. There's so much money in crypto exchanges, right? And so I feel that this is maybe a pro as well, that people don't know how we protect the money, but as long as you check our track record, we've been doing absolutely great, right? So, I have finished. This are the two things I want to talk about today. Number one, language, 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 to make crypto accessible for all, and number two, Centralized exchanges are also a very useful cross-chain bridge when it comes to the splitting of liquidity across a lot of different L1s and a lot of different L2s. Now, to the last section, I have a lot of minutes left. We will go to question and answer. Um, if I don't have time to answer your question, or if I... Or if you are shy and you want to ask the question privately, you can find me in the booth. We are in the purple booth, the big one. So, is there a mic around? Does anyone have, have some the questions? The oh, yes, please. Does anyone have any questions? Don't be shy. I just had a question about uh, um, security. You know, when you are in the centralized exchange, normally money is over there. So it's very interesting for all of the hackers to uh, um, hack the website. But in decentralized, normally it's nothing over there. So it's not interesting for a hacker because a smart contract working over there. Mm -hmm. I think that there is a fundamental assumption that I do not agree with is that decentralized exchanges actually have a lot of money in there. Right? The liquidity pools uh, represent value. So people who provide liquidity into the liquidity pools are locking up their value with the decentralized exchange and um, there have been very, very big decentralized exchange hackings recently. I'm not saying that one is good and one is bad, no, no. Uh, I'm saying that uh, on decentralized exchanges, the risk of hacking is real and true as well, but just like a centralized exchange. Thank you for your question. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Anyone? Yeah. I think we have time to answer. Oh, we have plenty of time. <laughs> One minute. Hey, Rona. Hi. I, I how much if I'm not wrong. Uh, Probate is number third in the world in the exchange. How do you plan to take this as a CEO to number one or to increase the volume of in the users? I see. Thank you for your question. I think that volume is a number that is a red herring. Right? Volume is a red herring. Because in a lot of other crypto exchanges that I have seen so far that used to be competing with me, right, they manipulate volume in so many different ways. Um, sometimes it's a machine trading with another machine, and that creates volume. Sometimes it is the project itself, you know, trading with themselves, and that creates volume. There are really many, many ways that people are manipulating the volumes. What coin market cap has done, right? I'm not affiliated with coin market cap, but I'm a huge fan. What coin market cap and coin gecko have done is that they have come up with a methodology to search web visits, volume, order book depth, and, and many other factors. With these factors put together, it is much harder to manipulate the volume. This is the first thing. The second thing is that when it comes down to volume, when you are screwing around, uh, trading with yourself, or, or even the order books are not entirely real, these exchanges close down the moment regulators come. Because they cannot show the books. 
And I have seen that among some of my other competitors who have chosen the quick buck way, the, the, the fast money way. They, they come up with all these kind of tricks and treats, right? And then when the regulators come, they cannot show the books. There is no chance they can be regulated because from the start, from the get-go, they have not run the exchange in a compliant manner, right? So I would say that volume is a red herring. It is a distraction. Do we have time for one more, Olya? We have a group of gentlemen here wanting to... Yes, we have one, uh, time for one more. Hi, my friend from Iran. <laughs> Hi. Uh, well, I wanted to ask, uh, for example, in centralized exchange, the money is in uh, centralized exchange wallet. So there's a huge chance, like, this, if there's anything goes wrong, not with, with the centralized exchange, but anything goes wrong uh, with the person due to KYC or anything, there is a chance that the central exchange will not pay to the person. Un unlike the DEX, which the person do the exchange without, like, it's just a one-time inter interaction. And the money is there in the value. I thought we were friends, but you asked the hardest questions. <laughs> yes and no. If the money is ill-gained, if we find that you have been money laundering, doing any criminal activity, or there's a police report, or there's some form of ill gains, we will hold the money until the police come and teach us what to do. Because we are not running anywhere. We are not anonymous. Right? We have companies, and I'm right here, so I have to be accountable. This is number one. However, uh, if you have not done anything wrong, then there is nothing to hide. There is no reason to be afraid, because we are not, as, as a company, we are not there to take one or two users' money. I mean, this, this is against the ethos. Right? We also want to make sure that our users have the best experience throughout. And I don't just speak for myself, uh, for my company, I can speak for quite all these crypto exchanges, is that we have processes put in place to make sure that if someone is doing something bad, we are going to catch you. But if you're not doing anything bad, then you don't have to worry. Right. So if the money comes from a D, uh, DEX hacking, for example, then we have to block it. Right? Then we have to block it. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you.